on World News Tonight. Historical resolution. Chinese president likely to secure an unprecedented third term in office. Escalating tensions. Russia bombarded by the EU as the border crisis escalates further. Reversing paralysis. A breakthrough treatment discovered with a new injectable therapy. Veterans Day. A program in Virginia makes a big difference for those who serve. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with China. Senior officials of China's ruling Communist Party held a four-day committee meeting. The members passed a resolution highlighting Xi Jinping's role. They are likely to help the president secure an unprecedented third term in office. China's ruling Communist Party approved a historical resolution that will help secure President Xi Jinping's leadership for at least another five years. China News reported on Thursday that the pivotal document came at the end of the party's Central Committee's meeting, or plenum, that ran for four days behind closed door in Beijing. The top political meeting brought together senior party officials who choose new leaders every five years. At the meeting, they approved the decision that marks the party's 100-year history and achievements and enshrines Xi's role as leader. An official summary read, under Mr. Xi's leadership, China has made historic achievements and undergone a historic transformation, including the economic success, foreign policy, fighting pollution, and containing COVID-19. The historical resolution is only the third of its kind since the party was founded in 1921. The previous resolutions were delivered by former leaders Ma Zedong and Deng Xiaoping and had the effect of consolidating their leaderships. A similar outcome is likely as it comes one year before Xi is expected to secure an unprecedented third term as party leader at a congress that is held once every five years. There is no apparent rival in view. Experts have pointed to China's constitutional change that removes the two-term limit on the presidency and a recent push of propaganda praising the leader as possible evidence. The official media briefing on the meeting is set for Friday. Russian President Vladimir Putin told the European Union it needs to start talks with Belarus if it hopes to resolve a crisis over hundreds of migrants trapped on the border with Poland. Russia traded barbs with Western members of the UN Security Council on Thursday over the migrant crisis on the Belarus-Poland border. The European Union has accused Belarus of encouraging thousands of migrants to cross into Poland and other neighboring countries as retaliation for sanctions. Many have done so with wire cutters they say were given to them by Belarusian border guards. The Security Council's Western Bloc on Thursday condemned Belarus's actions, calling President Alexander Lukashenko a threat to regional stability. We condemn the orchestrated instrumentalization of human beings whose lives and well-being have been put in danger for political purposes by Belarus, with the objective of destabilizing neighboring countries. Russia doubled down on its support for ally Belarus, though it has denied its own involvement in the crisis. Its deputy ambassador to the UN, Dmitry Polyansky, called the accusations masochistic. Frankly, I started to suspect that maybe our Estonian, French and other colleagues, they have some kind of masochist uh, inclinations because to raise this topic, uh, which are total shame for the EU uh, in front of us, would be very brave. Poland's defense ministry on Thursday released footage of what appeared to be border guards sending migrants away. While Belarus warned the crisis could escalate into a military confrontation. Ukraine, which has said it would deploy thousands more troops on its own border, also released footage of drills meant to hold migrants back. Most of the migrants have remained trapped between Belarus and Poland's borders, enduring freezing weather in makeshift camps. Poland has reported at least seven migrant deaths in the months-long crisis. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin and Germany's outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel held their second phone conversation in two days to discuss the migrant crisis at the EU-Belarus border. For more on this, let's cross over to Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Malcha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. For more, Malcha. Yes, Shanali. They underline the importance of an early settlement of the acute crisis in line with international humanitarian standards. Putin suggested restoring contacts between the EU states and Belarus to resolve the issue. Putin and Merkel had a phone call a day earlier to exchange views on the refugee crisis and expressed concerns over its humanitarian consequences. Poland is refusing to allow migrants to cross, accusing Minsk of luring them to Belarus to send across the border in revenge for sanctions. The EU has so far refused any direct contact with the Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, who warned that any new sanctions would be met with response. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said earlier that we, the Western policy towards the Middle East and North Africa had led to tensions. Back to you, Shanari. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Malsha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. South Korea and the United States agreed to launch ministerial level dialogue on energy policy to strengthen cooperation. Seoul proposed holding the first round of talks in Seoul in the nation early next year. Seoul and Washington will launch ministerial level dialogue on energy policy, dubbed as the Energy Policy Dialogue, to foster cooperation on clean energy and climate challenges. South Korea's Industry Ministry said Thursday that its minister, Moon seung Wook and U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm agreed on plans in Washington on Wednesday. The latest settlement is also a follow-up of the summit between the leaders of South Korea and the U.S. in May, when the two sides pledged a stronger partnership toward realizing the goal of going carbon neutral by 2050. Consisting of three departments at the director general level, policy, technology and commercialization, the advanced EPD will play a role in supporting decarbonization of both countries' economies. The policy division will share ideas and long-term strategies related to net zero emissions, where policy coordination on agendas such as an emissions trading system will be possible. In the technology sector, joint research and R&D cooperation in promising fields will be carried out, along with addressing weaknesses in supply chain in relation to clean energy and decarbonization. The commercialization division will serve to accelerate technological innovation and supply and encourage a participation of private sectors to create more jobs. Proposing the inaugural EPD meeting in South Korea early next year, Minister Moon also suggested the establishment of a Star Washington Net Zero Cooperation Center within a U.S. State Research Institute to promote personnel and technology exchanges. Welcoming his suggestions, Graham Holm voiced hope that the talks will deploy key technical solutions to enable sustainable energy growth while mitigating the impact of climate change, all while realizing the commitments laid out by the leaders of the two nations. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back and now we move on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and senior aides holed up in a nuclear bunker to simulate an outbreak of a vaccine-resistant COVID-19 variant to which children are vulnerable, describing such eventuality as a next war. This is Israel's nuclear command bunker, built more than a decade ago out of concern over Iran's nuclear program and missile exchanges with Lebanon and Gaza. But on this day, it's being used by Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and top aides as a pseudo-pandemic command center to simulate a turn for the worse in the fight against COVID. Thursday's drill simulates an outbreak of a vaccine-resistant COVID-19 variant to which children are vulnerable, describing such an eventuality as the next war. Bennett spoke to Rum the facility in the Jerusalem Hills about the drill. Well, the first lesson uh, we're learning in the midst of this uh, national pandemic uh, exercise is that we have to prepare for the next war and not for the previous war. To enhance the challenge of the one-day exercise, Bennett had to be kept unaware of specific scenarios. 
The script sees a fictitious strain, Omega, bypassing the vaccines which Israel rolled out at record pace this year. Omega also sickens children, largely spared by the actual virus, prompting mass hospitalizations and school closures. As part of the simulation, Bennett said he had ordered Israeli children, including his own four, confined to their homes while the government sealed off the borders and conferred with the Palestinian Authority, Gaza officials, and Jordan. Unlike a war war game, a pandemic war game is not secret. Uh, quite the contrary, we want to share the information. So whilst uh, in Israel we're very used to conducting war games, this unique uh, pandemic game is one which we uh, are eager to share. For the Prime Minister, if there's one takeaway, it's this. And the main lesson is move fast, move hard. Bennett said Israel will brief foreign leaders next week on the findings of the drill. South Korea reported 2,368 new COVID-19 infections, a slight drop from the day before. But the number of critically ill patients remain at record levels. Health authorities have said that if the number of critical patients keep rising, it could make it difficult for the country to further ease virus prevention measures. On Thursday, KDCA Chief Chung eun Gyung cautioned that if the number of critically ill patients keeps rising, the country could face difficulties moving to the second stage of the gradual return to normal scheme. The second stage of that gradual return had been set to start in December. The number of patients in critical condition has been at record levels for the past three days, inching up to 475 on Friday. Authorities have attributed this uptick to the length of this current wave of the pandemic. They added that though the trend is concerning, it's not yet close to crippling the current medical capacity. They said there are plenty of hospital beds available. Meanwhile, authorities have urged more people to get vaccinated and those at high risk to get their booster shots. As of Thursday, more than 840,000 have received an extra jab. The authorities have not only been considering implementing regular booster shots, but also reducing the interval between the original jab and the extra shot from six months to five, specifically for senior citizens at higher risk. To make booster shots even more accessible, from today, target groups can reserve leftover vaccines using Naver and Cacao Talk on the day they want their jabs. As of Friday, South Korea has fully vaccinated 77.6% of the population. We have some good news for you. Northwestern University researchers have developed a new method they say can reverse paralysis and repair tissue after severe spinal cord injuries. Spinal cord injury has been a major challenge for science for decades. Scientists at Northwestern University say they may have found a breakthrough treatment for reversing paralysis in humans after successfully administering a new injectable therapy in mice. Samuel I. Stupp leads the research. That the central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spinal cord, which sends messages between your brain and the rest of your body, has very limited capacity to repair after injury. In a new study, the team describes an injection of, quote, dancing molecules to reverse paralysis in mice and repair tissues after severe spinal cord injuries. Just four weeks after the injection, the injured animals regained the ability to walk. This is probably the most important paper I have ever written. And it describes a piece of science that was truly unknown. The new breakthrough therapeutic is injected as a liquid directly into the spine. It influences the motion of molecules, in effect making them dance, so they can more easily engage with constantly moving cellular receptors. When molecules did not move or moved very little, then the response that we observed in the animals was just a slight twitching of the, of the limbs, but no ability to walk. When we use the exact same therapy, the exact same signals, but we molecularly changed the structures so that the molecules would move more, now we saw full ability of the animals to walk. The therapy immediately gels into a complex network of nanofibers that mimic the extracellular matrix of the spinal cord. One way to think about this 
is that if the molecules are dancing around or leaping out of the fibers, the probability that they will meet up with the receptors is increased. We recognized this as a new concept that had never been done and had remarkable success in improving the recovery after spinal cord injury. Published in the journal Science, the Northwestern team claims this is the first study in which researchers controlled the collective motion of molecules through changes in the chemical structure. Stepp said they now want to push for human trials, bypassing large animal testing. We are definitely headed for the FDA to seek approval for use of our novel therapy in clinical trials. And we are very excited about this possibility that will make a huge difference to patients. According to the National Spinal Cord Injury Statistical Center, nearly 300,000 people in the U.S. are currently living with a spinal cord injury. NASA and SpaceX, the private rocket company of Elon Musk, launched four more astronauts on a flight to the International Space Station, including a veteran spacewalker and two younger crewmates chosen to join NASA's forthcoming lunar missions. Ten, nine. Eight, NASA and private rocket company SpaceX five, launched four astronauts into orbit late on Wednesday. One, zero. Ignition. On board was a veteran spacewalker, two younger crewmates chosen for future lunar missions, and a German materials scientist. They blasted off from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida at 10 p.m. Eastern, and off they shot with a reddish fireball glow. The liftoff of the Dragon spacecraft has been named Endurance by the crew, who waved at the camera as the launch appeared to go flawlessly. Within 10 minutes of liftoff, the rocket's upper stage had delivered the crew capsule into orbit. Meanwhile, the rocket's reusable lower stage, having detached from the rest of the spacecraft, flew itself back to Earth. They are due to arrive at the space station orbiting some 250 miles above the Earth on Thursday evening, following a flight of about 22 hours. The flight marks the third operational space station crew sent to orbit. The latest mission also follows a flurry of recent high-profile astro-tourism flights, including the SpaceX launch in September of Inspiration4. The first all civilian crew sent to orbit without a professional astronaut on board. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The death toll in the Astro World Festival stampede rose to nine with the death of a 22-year-old Texas college student, according to a lawyer for the family. South Korea's second largest car maker Kia will only sell electric vehicles in Europe countries from 2035 and other major markets from 2040. Kia announced their 2045 carbon neutrality strategy, paving the way for a transition away from fossil fuels. The latest report by the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization projects the global food import bill should top 1.75 trillion US dollars, up 14% on year. The surge comes amid global supply chain disruptions, reduced harvest output and the energy crisis. Passengers at airports nationwide are experiencing disruption due to a system error in Jing Air. The local low-cost carrier announced that boarding procedures and ticketing are being delayed due to glitches in the passenger service system. Prosecutors in the murder trial of Kyle Rittenhouse said that they would seek approval for the jury to consider lesser charges, a move that could lower the burden of proof for conviction. And finally tonight, retired Army Sergeant Steve Holtz founded Black Horse Forge to bring the art of blacksmithing and more to veterans, active duty service members and first responders. More than 11,000 veterans have participated in the free classes and over 100 say it saved their lives. Inside this small Virginia shop, the banging, the shaping and the crafting are helping veterans deal with the twists and turns of civilian life. Yeah, that's what I'm nervous about. This is Black Horse Forge, a nonprofit for vets, active duty servicemen and women, and first responders. Our mission is healing, 
and building a community and family. Army Sergeant Steve Holtz, who served in Desert Storm, founded the forge, providing free classes in the art of blacksmithing and so much more. You come in here, you can be yourself. The goal is to help vets, many of whom, like Holtz, suffer from PTSD and traumatic brain injury. So far, more than 11,000 people have participated. More than 100 say it saved their lives. We want all those negative things left here and when you go back out into the world you know that's all put behind you. Holtz says focusing on creating something tangible helps take the focus away from anxieties and troubles in part because they become part of a community of people with shared experiences. They make and sell knives, jewelry and decorative pieces and all profits go back into the forge helping people like Marine Sergeant Justin Dupriest, who lost his 12-year-old daughter Jordan to brain cancer. I have a piece of steel in my hand, I have a hammer, and I'm just working through it. And by the time I'm done, my arm hurts, but we've been cracking jokes for the last hour. His wife Kimberly sees a difference. Many of them know similar experiences and pains and heartache. They just build this comradeship and it's been really, really good for him. Good for him and for thousands of others changing and saving lives. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.